Now, where did I put that? Hmm. Ah, here it is. Welcome to the toolbox. Tools for life and everything in between. Stuff you can use or toss, it's up to you. Well, welcome back everybody to Tools for the Toolbox. This is episode six now. Thanks for joining us again. I'm gonna introduce you to, well, correction, I'm gonna have my friend here introduce you, uh, introduce you to himself. So without further ado, who are you and what is your military background? Hey Chance, uh, thanks for having me on your show here. My name is Grant Ellsworth. Uh, my military background is I've got uh, three years with the 3 PPCLI regiment. I have one operational tour of duty, um, Op Athena, which was from 2004 to 2005. We were part of a recce unit attached to the Strathcona's at that time on that mission. Uh, I don't do that now anymore. I haven't done that for quite a while, actually. Uh, what I'm doing now is I'm a federal corrections officer, and I've been doing that for 12 years. And Man, I talk. It'll be fun. Yeah, well, speaking of that, so I talk to um, a lot of guys that they, they make the same transition over. They, they end up going from the infantry to, to corrections or even just other veterans end up here. And you would think um, you would think that would be a natural uh, transition once you get out of there to here. And I can tell you it's a very rough transition. It's quite the opposite. So anybody that's listening, if you're in that boat where you're thinking of getting out or trying something new and you want to try this job, it's rough. Yeah. Um, the reason why it's so rough is the uh, response to command is quite a bit different. So, for example, you know, in the military, you're, you're taught discipline. So whenever someone tells you to do something, you, you do it, you do it right now and you get it done. You go from that to a position of authority where you have to direct people to do things. And these people are quite simply, they just they hate you. They're all they're all convicted criminals and they just hate you for that crest you wear on your um, on your shoulder. And so at the very start, it's very rough and it's a very, you know, it's a tribal thing, but it's a tribal thing all over again, except it's in a lot more negative light. Like, you know, you're just, you're the, you're a pig or you're whatever derogatory uh, term of the week is they want to call you until, you know, you prove that you're kind of okay. And by okay, I mean like, um, you know, you're not just going to get ready to fly off the handle and, and just be very authoritative. You know, you just, you got to work in some shades of gray. You have to understand these people, they... They come from different backgrounds. They come from different upbringings. So you have to learn different ways of communicating with them. And once you kind of get a handle on that and, and you understand that way, it's um, it's not so bad, but it's very different from a military experience for sure. Yeah. It seems like it would so, be like a, a real test in leadership, right? Because it's not so much the, the worst thing you can do in a leadership position is fall back on rank. And I imagine it's probably the similar to just fall back on like, well, I'm the fucking guard. So do what I tell you. I imagine that it's a similar methodology, right? You want to engage the person. You want to figure out what works for them in terms of communication style and, um, you know, things like that. But it seems like a real test in your own personal leadership to get anything done in that environment. Yeah, no, it is. And what you're referring to there is called positional power. So what that is, is like what you just kind of said was, you know, I have this rank on, so you have to listen to me, even if you're a fuckhead or whatever. It's like, yes, I still have the rank, so you still have to listen to me. You might not respect me, but you still kind of have to because there's there's repercussions for that. You never want to be that person. You'll have a very long and you'll have a very stressful career. And, and it doesn't matter what occupation you're in. That is universal across the board. So the biggest the biggest piece of advice I could give to anyone for transition um, and even just in a leadership role or if you're out there in some kind of a um, authority figure is you have to learn your job as in you have to learn the policies and and the procedures for your job but you also have to layer your own personality into that and that will give you the most authentic version of you you'll be able to get your points across the most effectively it will never feel like you're really trying or pretending to be somebody else which i can tell you right now people hate themselves for doing that and it's very hard plus like i said working in in corrections now um you get really good at sniffing people out after a while because you just you pick that trade up because you're dealing with all kinds of people and you always got to be on your guard and nobody likes a fake so you know just be yourself and and if you do that people will respect you they they, they don't respect you for something you're trying to be and that's universal i think we can all understand that so yeah just be yourself yeah one of the hardest things i found for not only tra transition but just life in the military as a whole was uh humility 
right? And the ability to recognize that you don't know everything, that your way isn't the only way shit gets done, and really to just chill the fuck out. <laughs> like, I, 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 see, I see a lot of guys that go through it and they get so worked up over, oh, I got to do this and I have to do this and I have to be here and this is what needs to happen, blah, 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 blah. And it's like, man, just like take your time. If you don't make a meeting, reschedule, right? It's not the military anymore. You're not, people don't die if you don't make a timing. It is much more relaxed than that. I'm not saying in corrections, but in life in general, right? You don't need to be so hard on yourself for when you're doing transition, when you get out. And I think that's a big part of it is just humility to recognize that your your way isn't the only way. Yeah, no, that's uh, that's a really great point. Actually, I kind of wasn't really, I, I never, I never even considered that one as thinking of transition. But that's like that's such a super important point, and um, I think the biggest uh, hurdle with that is just knowing your environment, um, the timings that and the strict structures have to be adhered to in a military fashion because literally lives are on the line, and snap decisions could mean the difference between half your section dying and, and not. Right, so yeah. um, just understanding that. Yeah, you're in a different environment, and you. And at first, you really have to, um, you have to consciously really remind yourself for the first little bit about those things. Just like you and I talked in uh, the podcast we did there. Whenever um, uh, the example that I used was whenever I went home, I went right from uh, overseas on HLTA, and I went home. And for the first couple of days, I would remember because what we did was whenever we got in our G wagons, all of our our G wagons are right beside our tent, so we'd have all our, our our gear in there ready to go, like the um the vests and the equipment and stuff like that. So, whenever I would open up the truck door, I would be looking at the seat puzzle, saying, you know, where the where the hell is my gear at? Like, mm-hmm. what's going on here? And it was just, it was a it was kind of a it was a fleeting thought, but I mean, the fact that the thought was still there, and I had a very real kind of a feeling and a reaction to it, and I was like. You know, it really drives the point home that, you know, you just got to remind yourself a little bit. Oh, and, and walking on grass, too. I, I was like, yeah. I got <laughs> such, such anxiety walking on grass. I couldn't believe that. And I was like, what's going on here? And it's like, yeah, um, you got to remember, you're not walking in a minefield. Like, it, it's okay. And, and you just got to kind of kind of got to remind ourselves that and it, I think after a while, it you know, like anything else, you adjust. But the, the first part, it can be very frustrating. So just take again what you're saying take your time slow down and just kind of realize where you are self-talk is huge because it kind of it kind of pumps the brakes on your brain free when you start doing that a little bit even though people may look at you like you're fucking kind of crazy a little bit but hopefully it doesn't take too much of it but um i found that really helps uh whenever i'm kind of stuck or if i'm got a hurdle i'm trying to break yeah i uh i remember the first time i got into a lab after overseas and i always we were, i was on qrf for like five months of my tour out of the eight and I, uh, we always hung our tack vest on a line inside the lab where we were sitting normally. So all you had to do is grab your armor and your rifle, right? And you just jumped inside the truck so we could just go. And I remember the first time I got into a lab, it wasn't even like we were driving anywhere special. I like walked into the lab and I sat down where I normally would sit and I went to put my, my tack vest on and I wasn't there. And I just like had a massive panic attack of like, where the fuck is my kid? <laughs> just... Oh my god. Oh my oh wait. Wait a second. And I, I was like looking around and we're in the the white elephant and behind the regiment, which is just like a big ass white tent, right? Where all the vehicles are parked and everyone's looking at me like, what the fuck is wrong with that guy? But uh you're yeah, you're right. It takes the self talk, the humility to re and to realize that you are not there anymore. And it that's a tough one. But uh moving along, you are you got uh, you've been what, ten plus years corrections now? Yeah, I got uh, 12 years completed there. I'm actually, it'll be this fall, I'll be uh, lucky 13. Oh, hoo, hoo, hoo. special time. Now, you've also, uh, you also run Honey Badger Alliance, correct? Yep. Okay, and what is that all about? So Honey Badger Alliance, if you um, if you just take a look at, well, really any of the content, because the same theme runs through everything between the podcasts and the videos and the, the blogs and all the little stuff I put up on my social media, it's basically um, cultivating... Uh, strength and resilience to, by a leading example. So uh, I don't believe in putting things out there that just make you feel good in, for a second. Like that's the same idea as gambling where, you know, you get your little bit of an upper and then you're down again. Yeah. Everything I put out there, even um, even like those little picture things, I put, usually put up uh, a write-up in there if it's a little bit more vague. And it gives you it gives you something to work with, but I also put it in a fashion where you could take it and use and make it into something actionable. And 
those things are all lessons I learned mostly from corrections where I am now. And I'm very fortunate that I was able to learn those lessons. And you talk about humility because yes, sometimes you have to realize that a, you're not right, or B, you have to change your tactic up because most people, you know, you get frustrated and angry and you bang your head against the wall and, and you know, it becomes just a roller coaster of that. So it's like, hey, if you're banging your head against the wall, something's not working, you got to change it up. So basically I put those, put those little points and tips, everything on there is something that I've learned the hard way and I've learned to make it work for me and cut some stress out of my life. Awesome. That's awesome. But, you know, we need more of that as, uh, as we were talking earlier, uh, leadership by example is such a, a huge tenant that the, I think the world needs right now. I mean, we have so much stuff going on right now, uh, in the world in not only in Canada, but in the U S and multiple countries, especially right now. Um, there's so much, there's so much talking, there's so much, uh, there's so many emotional, crazy things out there. But if you look at um, you look at anybody in history that's made a huge change, it was always an individual, and it was always them doing something. It wasn't people talking. It wasn't people. You know, we need to do this to feel good. Um, people, we 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 learn by watching, and like social uh, social rules, I guess for lack of a better term, are set by the actions of the group. So if you start those actions and you start people off properly, it just like a, you know, just like a virus, it, it, it becomes infectious and that people will mirror that. So it's super important that if you're on the spotlight, your actions reflect accordingly because people will follow that. Absolutely. You know, one of the reasons why, uh, we teach leadership so heavily throughout the military, uh, is specifically because of that, right? You have to show people how to do things because you can tell someone all day long but until they actually see it done it will never quite click and then you know there's a tenant that the officers always say and it's follow me right it's not you go ahead it's follow me i will lead you come with and then there are so many battles throughout history that you could call upon where you know one officer stood up in the in the midst of it all and was like, follow me, and they charged up a hill, or they attacked a fortified position, or they were able to uh, secure something that no one thought was securable, right? It was always the one dude that changed the situation based off of his actions, not just the what he was saying. And unfortunately, a lot of times it usually gets them killed, but it usually spurs <laughs> the, uh, the troops to get something done. And like you said, it is the, uh, it is the act, not the words. Right, it is them actually doing it that gets people to, to get up off their ass and change. And I think that's such an important thing right now. It's that <clears throat> nothing changes without the work. Well, yeah, let's and let's pick that apart a little bit, just because, like I said, all this current stuff that's going on and all this craziness too. Um, so the other thing is actions are a lot harder to uh, dispute. Words can be twisted around, words can be misinterpreted, but an action, it's like the action. This person is fucking doing exactly this. And here's the other part of that too. Now. If I tell you, if I say, Chance, I want you to go and I want you to go and carry that uh, twenty-pound bucket of water up that hill, you're gonna be like, "Fuck you, carry the water yourself," because we don't we don't like being told what to do. We're very resistant to that, especially if we're told how to act. We hate that because it's like, you know, there's an ego thing in there. It's like I'm a I'm a already a normal person. I understand things. It's like, what? Who the hell are you to tell me what to do? You don't know me. But if I see you, hey, Chance is carrying those heavy fucking buckets of water up the hill. Shit, I better get on there and help. Like that that changes the that changes how that plays it all together. Yep. So you know, for anybody you know listening and you know, if you want to get something done, if you want to make some real positive change, whether with, if it's whatever's going on now or just anything that comes down the road, like it, the fundamental is the same, whether you're taking a trench, whether you're taking an encampment, whether you're, you know, you're, you're doing, you're protesting things like injustices or whatever. It's like, what, what are you doing to, what are you doing? What are you contributing? Cause yeah. you can sit there and talk all day. You contribute nothing. Yeah. You gotta be, you have to be part of the solution, right? And the solution is work <laughs> and that's what i think a lot of the disconnect for a lot of things that are going on right now is that there's work involved and it's not going to be easy it's not going to be nice it's going to suck and it's going to be a grind and it's going to put you in places that you don't really want to be but it's required and unless you're willing to put that work in shit ain't going to get done and there there is there are so many th uh, times during history you could just call upon where uh you know someone put the work in and things changed and was it easy 
No. Was it difficult? Hell yes. But it got done. And the important thing is, that's the other important thing. Is it difficult? Yes. But are you learning something? Yeah. Whenever you're starting to struggle, you learn you learn better methods. You learn better ways of figuring that problem out because it's like you don't want to stay there and suffer and struggle for so long. And then guess what? The problems are going to come up all your life. So if you if you figure out a structured system to use to solve your problems with, and usually, you know, you learn that the hard way the first time, you know, and that's going to stick. It's like all of a sudden life's problems they might be they, the next set of problems might even be bigger but they might not feel as bigger or seem as bigger because now you've got at least a way to tackle it and look at it and, and systematically take it apart so it, it's super important just to kind of throw yourself into something and try and figure it out absolutely i can't think of a time that life was easy for me where i learned something out of it like i i can't i can think of lots of times where life was extremely difficult and i learned something out of it for sure but if life is easy you're not getting anything out of it. I, like, I don't, I don't see anything you're getting out of that, but uh, life is weird right now. And uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll see what happens in the future, right? So speaking of the future, yeah, you got any plans? Any big plans for the future? Are you going to continue pushing Honey Badger Alliance? Are you going to stay corrections? What do you got on the go? Oh, I, I, at this point now, it's starting to gain some traction. And I'm starting to get, the nice thing is I'm starting to get the feedback that I want to hear is, is, um, you know, I'm glad that I can put stuff out there, but I'm way more happy to hear that people are saying like the the stuff is actually making a difference in their life. So it's like, okay, the the uh, the idea paid off. It took me, and that's the other thing you were talking about with uh, struggling and stuff like that. The first year, um, if anybody's listening and you want to go back and see some really shitty, poor quality stuff, go back and check <laughs> out the stuff I was putting out the, the first year. And I, I remember lots of times I wanted to give up doing that too. Cause I'm like, what the fuck am I doing here? And like, it, it's a, it's kind of a touchier subject because no one wants to really, uh, to some of those things they don't want to engage because it's kind of got a negative connotation. So I'm like, okay, I, the message is right. But the way I'm conveying the message is, is not working. So I, I kind of had to figure it out and I kind of remodeled it. And, and now it's starting to get some really good traction. It's starting to get some really good positive feedback that, um, that podcast, that trial and triumph, man, oh man, the feedback I get from that, from the people that listen to those is, is unreal. They really, really like that show. So I'm kind of, I'm kind of glad I took that idea and ran with it. And it didn't even start. It didn't even start as that. It started as something a little bit more superficial. I was like, I just want to inject some positivity in here. So, um, let's talk about some success stories. But then when you put the, uh, when you put the spin of success on something and you want people to tell a story, uh, they're willing to tell you it, it seems like, um, way, way more, um, just, uh, heartbreaking stories or disheartening stories or just like really crazy traumatic stories with that spin of success. And I, I was like, okay, there's some, actually some real value here because the way people were telling it too, I was like, um, I can get this. I can understand this. This is a very, it, it brought a very human element to it. And I think what the value in, in, in it is where most peer support things, um, don't get to address is it shows you it shows us where people are when they're emotionally at their worst and i think that's where even peer support and help because people are kind of they're a little bit unwilling to talk about it when they're in that but if you can hear whenever someone was at their worst and then how they kind of problem solve their way out of it that's like okay this person i felt the same as this person and this is what they did well i'm going to try that it might not work but at least now you're you know you're five more steps up on the rung of that ladder instead of right you know, knee deep in the, in the shit. Right. So, um, that's, that's been going really good. Um, so yeah, I'm going to keep pushing that. I got a couple of other things I'm kind of brainstorming with right now. Me and another guy completed a, a little bit of a different project yesterday. I'm going to announce that in the coming days. I think, uh, you know what it is cause we talked about it already, but I, I did get that one going. Um, aside from that, I, th- I'd, think i'm just going to stay where i am in corrections though because if i'm getting the growth outside of there um being where i am right now is as i work right in a cell block with the inmates so i get to go every day and i get to have those hard conversations i get to you know keep um to finding ways to improve my ways that i relate with people you know and and i can tell you right now at almost 13 years in it's been uh it's been a pretty rewarding ride um just like the just like the military but in a different sense corrections is a very it can go very one way or the other because you're dealing with two different types of people in a very close range so the the other thing the other thing what makes it so uh traumatic and stressful it took me a little bit to figure it out i was like why do we have such high rates of stress and and ptsd and stuff whenever 
um, we don't have quite as many deadly force incidents. I was like, oh, because everything's so close, but everything's personal. Mm -hmm. Like you, you see that, you see that same guy day in and day out. So it's like, if you see him coming down the hall, you're already, your body starts kicking in that little bit of that, uh, dribble of the chemical cocktail. Cause it's like, you just, you know, that fight's coming. Right. And yep. it's like, you have, you have these back and forth. Now it's not, not more of a, it's not more of a subject is doing bad thing. You know, we have to try and stop subject from doing, doing bad thing. It's like this guy, you know, he's, he's going to do bad thing, but he's also going to take these digs at you and he's going to make it personal kind of deal. So I'm yeah. um, learning to really navigate that and to avoid it, mitigate it is, is huge. And that, that translates into every other aspect of life. Um, I found some great value with that. Like just my relationship with relationships with um, my friends, uh, my family, all those things have been able to improve it, but I had to really, I had to really do a lot of research and I had to do a lot of soul searching and I had to do a, re a lot of pumping the brakes. Because if you don't, it can it can take you the other way, and people can lead you all around by the nose and and lead you just into a big ball of stress and depression and just fucking bullshit. So, um, very rewarding, but also at the same time, if I'm going to continue to add value to other people's lives, you know, I I want to stay there and I want to keep learning in that capacity. I want to keep getting better that way as well. Which is awesome. You know, one of the things that I learned very early on in my uh, time in the military and outside of it was. There's no greater bond than shared uh, <clears throat> difficulty. If you are going through a really shitty time in your life, it will, and you hear about somebody who is going through a really shitty time in their life, and they're managing to get through it, it is much easier for you to go, oh, is that all they did? They just changed their mindset? Oh, well, I, you know, I can not hang out with these people anymore if it's going to lead me to there. Or uh, one of the things I... <laughs> this great experience in uh, Wainwright. It was minus 53 with the wind, and we were out just waiting uh, to do a live fire exercise in the middle of winter. We were wearing snowshoes. We had all our friggin' Arctic gear. Like, it was, it was brutally cold, and the wind was just howling, and we're standing in the middle of an open field in Wainwright. It was awesome. And uh, well, I was going to say, yeah, no, as soon as you started describing that, I was like, that's a very familiar circumstance. I, yeah, I, uh, if I never had to do, don't have to do one of them again, I wouldn't be, yeah, I wouldn't be sad. Uh, yeah, running with the snowshoes and then you, you get kind of carried away and you trip and fall and you go head first into the snow bank and then you, your barrel gets full of snow and you got to take all that apart and clean it off in that cold. And then, yeah, you got like, I remember. We had, uh, I had my balaclav on with my fucking toque over the top of it because we were, I don't think it was quite that cold. We were still in the 40s range, but it was in the mid minus 40s. But fuck me, uh, it's, it's, yeah, wow. Yeah. You definitely, you definitely learn character building there. That's for sure. <laughs> well, the benefit was, is that we, uh, I remembered a, a, a documentary I had seen about penguins and how they stay warm during the winter months in Antarctica. And one of the things they do is they create basically a giant, continually moving spiral. So the people in the middle slowly work their way to the outside and the people on the outside slowly work their way to the inside. So you have this two spirals constantly slowly working in and amongst each other and it generates a lot of body heat. And so I described it to the, all my buddies and they're all like, oh, fuck, does that work? I'm like, I don't know. Should we try it? And we're like, yeah, sure, let's try it. And so my, uh, my officer came back from <laughs> getting orders or something. I can't remember what he was doing, but he shows up and my entire troop is sitting in this little spirals, <laughs> slowly working around each other. We had guys in the center who were taking their jackets off. They're like, it's too hot in here. Let me out. It's too hot. And it's like, just wait your turn. The guys on the outside need to come back in. And uh, we made it through, you know, I think we were out there for like four or five hours of just slowly freezing to death. And then we were like, okay, well, let's go do a live fire X. And there was lots of awesomeness involved in that because we were doing a full squadron. Or uh, no, yeah full squadron so we had all three of our troops out there uh we had the first troop was coming up the center shooting at the targets and didn't realize whoever did the recce ruins i say in air quotes uh that were supposed to be there were actual physical reinforced concrete ruins of a building that was there so we were taking rounds ricochet rounds from the the center guys were getting ricocheted back at themselves the right flank was shooting into uh, the center, which was then ricocheting at the left flank, and the left flank was shooting. And so it basically became a two-way range of ricochets freaking everywhere. Guys were taking knees in three and a half foot of snow, right? So you take a knee, and then that doesn't hold because you're supposed to be in snowshoes, and then you fall over, and you laze your entire section. It was insane. <laughs> it was insane. But we all came, what the hell just happened? 
I can't believe we all survived that. And we all actually got tighter as a group because of the shared hardship. And that is one of the things that, you know, especially the military, but I imagine in corrections too, is that when you have to deal with a major fight on your hands as a group, that group is that much tighter. I can tell you right now that I'm very fortunate to have been working quite a few years with a group exactly like that. Um, We have all had experiences together in crazy situations where like there's these rusty blades flying around and and you know just people fighting and just craziness and 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 uh yeah no it, it really makes a difference uh, especially your confidence level because if there's only like a handful of you and you have to deal with like you know 10 or 20 people like that makes a huge difference not only that but there's another um thing as well whenever you learn whenever you earn that trust with each other after a while um you know you have all those things that you're you're mentally trying to deal with and unpack or whatever and sometimes it gets to be a little too overwhelming you have that trust where you can actually talk with your peers at that point because you've established that none of you are actually like weak because that's the biggest thing is you don't want to nobody ever wants to appear weak because they don't want to be the um the weakest link in the tribe right yep. but when it, whenever you get to that level where you've already you know been with each other and you've proven to each other that okay i've got your back for sure 100 percent. if you know you need me i'm there um when you can start having those conversations that really is that really completes the circle of uh you know the holistic the way you want to be a, a warrior because then you have your balance too right you can you can fight but you can fight with a clear mind because now you understand that other people are going through the same things and that's okay yeah and then you know you now you have more tools to work them out because now it's like well hey what worked for you and hey i found this kind of works for me and and your team just gets overall even more strong the other value in that too is like you know if then if you know if, you, if something big ever comes along and, and you have to deal with it it's like you become very good at making shit happen really really quick and then you get more towards like even in the capacity like that it gets more towards like a military type of response as far as like effectiveness goes mm-hmm. um where it's just like you can organize things really really quick and everybody knows their place and everybody gets it done yep. so it's, it, it truly is amazing to have groups of people um that can work together like that i'm very interested about that um that penguin thing so how long did it take to get that going to get that kind of heat generated in the center i'm kind of really curious about that now. honestly it was probably within the first five minutes when you have Wow. We have 40 plus guys all basically standing in a circle and just you all we were moving it like a a crawl. You're just kind of like stepping three, four inches at a time. Right. And you're just so you're slowly moving and you have the outside circle moving counterclockwise and then you have your inside circle moving clockwise. So you basically as you hit the center, you you change directions and then you come back out. So you have two separate lines that are moving against each other. And just because you're in such close proximity, you create, you generate an enormous amount of heat. Um, We had it going with about 10 people and it was working. Like we were still pretty warm. And then everybody else was like, wow, that seems to be working. And those guys look pretty warm. (laughs) And then we just had more people jump on and jump on and jump on. And then we had this huge uh, pile of dudes. And it's just seen the look on my LT's face when he showed up. Just like, what in the fuck are you guys doing? And I'm like, get in the circle, sir. Yeah. <laughs> I just, I stood up and I'm like, we're penguins, sir. And he was like, I don't fucking care. Get over here and we're doing orders. And I'm like, cool, man, let's do it. Uh, but yeah, it was, <laughs> it was an interesting time. So now I'm sure in your time, especially in corrections, you've had some to deal with anger and we're here to talk about anger. So right off the bat, I'm going to give you a real tough question because I think this this causes a lot of issues in a lot of uh, people that never really experience true anger. Is anger a bad thing? I think for the most part, anger is a bad thing. Um, it's not completely a bad thing, uh, and I'll get to that, but I'll get to why I think it's a bad thing first. And I, and I was thinking about this. This is just me. This is nowhere else. This is just me because I sit here and my mind never stops working. Anger is an emotion. Emotions are very real. We still have to acknowledge and feel those. Like every other emotion on the spectrum, whether it be sadness or happiness or anger, I think those come about whenever we're put into a situation where we don't have any control of either immediate or we're able to get a control on. And that's why we have these outbursts. Um, Anger, I found in my experience, it clouds your judgment. It definitely causes you to miss things. Um, The other... The other side effects of anger is if you if it's unresolved, say if you have, um, for example, a, a verbal altercation with someone and it doesn't end well, then two things come of that. First of all, 
all of those things, they, they manifest physically. So whenever you get anger again, as I, as I said a while ago, say, so if I'm like, you know what, fuck you chance. And you know, you, we start back and forth. Well, now we start putting on uh, more aggressive body language. Well, we pick up on that stuff. Our, our limbic system picks up on that stuff and it gets us ready for that fight, whether that's real or, or perceived. And it kicks a little bit of that, um, that chemical cocktail in there, you know, the cortisol and the adrenaline, the noradrenaline, the endorphins and uh, the cortisol and um, our dopamine. Sorry, I already said cortisol twice, dopamine. And anyways, that's, that kind of gives us our, our little bit of a, that's like our, pre, our nature's pre-workout. It gets us ready for that fight. So we have the advantage. And if you don't flush that out after the fact, you know, it kind of keeps you on high alert. It's going to keep you jumpy. And where that translates into is you're going to, you're going to take more offense. If you're dealing with somebody else, say you're going to take more offense to it now because you're already on high alert. It changes the way you perceive things, the way you, you hear and interpret information. I wasn't going to say the other thing with anger. Um, yeah, no, it, it's just in general, I, it just clouds your judgment. Um, it's a sign that you don't have control of things. You definitely do not have control of yourself. However, it's a very real thing. So I think the biggest thing is you have to understand that you're always going to feel it. How quickly and effectively you can get a lid on it, get a hold of it, or at least put it off to the side until you can figure out what you need to do to start making shit happen. Um, that's a big, um, that's a big advantage and that's definitely a skill to learn. Yeah. The only time I've ever found anger to be a good thing is whenever I use fake anger instrumentally. And again, this comes back to the some of the clientele I use. Um, this may sound a bit foreign to some people, but if people grow up in lifestyles where they've been abused or if their parents are drug addicts or, or they live in very pred- predatory um, environments or you know they grow up with gang members, the language that they use and the language that we use is not the same thing. So if you need to get a point across or if you have to... Uh, you know, you need to direct somebody to do something and it's just in general, they don't respect you or don't like you. Sometimes it does work, but it's a very calculated thing. And it's like, I don't, I'm not truly angry. Like I'm not taking it personal, but I still have to, I still have to put that illusion on because that's what they understand. It's very rare, but sometimes it does work. That's the only way I've ever seen anger as a good thing. Yeah. I was going to say that, you know, anger is something that it can be used as a tool for sure. Especially um, like when I was an instructor, if you show anger all the time, then it's useless. But if you're angry at specific points, then it you know it shows the recruits that what you just did was over the line, right? And that becomes the basis of how they learn. Um, but at the same time, it, you know, it, I don't know, I kind of look at it as a 50-50 thing because anger can be useful if used correctly. It can lead you to learn about yourself, right? Like if you all of a sudden get angry about something that somebody said and you are introspective enough to look at it and say, well, why am I getting angry about that? That doesn't make any sense. And then you can realize that it was, I don't know, based on something else, or maybe you didn't like the way, the way it was said or whatever, but you have to be introspective enough to actually see it. Uh, But I think you're right. You know, for the most part, anger, really, it just, it clouds your judgment. It, uh, it puts you in a, in a place that you're going to make snap decisions. You're going to be saying things that you normally wouldn't. Uh, you know, it kills that filter, <laughs> and then, uh, you, then you put yourself in even worse positions because you didn't have control of the situation to begin with. I really like what you just said there too. Um, uh, about, you know, you, you learn a lot about yourself. The other thing too is, um, you you learn a lot of perspective if you can if you can wield the understanding of that appropriately and properly. So, um, you kind of hit the nail on the head there when you said, you know, okay, what does that say about me? What are my triggers? But the other thing you learn from it then is better communication skills. Yeah. Um, so, for example, say if you say something, and, and and that's the other thing with language too. Like we all use the same words, but language is the way we understand them. Um, this is huge with this is huge with uh, um, you know married couples. You know uh, how many times have you had a, a ridiculous fight over something and and you argue for you know two to three to four hours at a time or something like that because it's like well this is fucking stupid. How come you don't fucking get it and this and that and and it's really. At that point, it's it, you're angry and frustrated because it becomes a conversation of dominance and not really problem solving. So the thing I learned from that is, okay, maybe I'm uh, perceiving this wrong. So it allows you then to take a step back and be like, okay, this is what you said. This is how I take it. Is that what you mean? Or, you know, something along that lines. And, and you know, I've had this happen a lot more often now than before where, yeah, I'll, I'll see something. I get really like, I get really irritated or I get pissed off. 
uh, somebody saying something like, Hey, you know what, what the fuck is the deal with that? Like, you know, is this, is this kind of what you mean here? Cause this looks kind of, this is what it looks like. And they're like, Oh, Oh no, not at all. It's like, well, okay, maybe, uh, you might want to change your wording a bit because this, this is how I take it or whatever. And like being able to do that and, and not holding on to things, um, not jumping on somebody right away and not holding resentment. And it could be, you know, and it could very well be, it could end up being a dickhead comment anyways, but you want to rule that out. And I found the model that I just mentioned is a very good way to kind of, to, to troubleshoot that if it is that or not. And most of the time it's not people, we don't want to fight with each other. We don't actually like confrontation. So, you know, if you're feeling frustrated, just pump the brakes and be like, okay, why am I getting mad? Explain to the person, okay, this is what you said. This is why I'm getting mad. Is this kind of, you know, what you meant by it? And that's usually enough to squash that right there. I bet you. 99% 99% of the time right there that solves that problem. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, I think it's pretty accurate, you know, throughout anybody that's ever been in the military knows that when we talk to each other we're some of the most offensive assholes <laughs> imaginable, right? Like we will say some really horribly despicable things to each other and we will laugh about it and then slap back with something even worse, right? <laughs> that's just how we deal with stress and all this other shit and how we actually deal with each other. And what I realized over time, I'm a big proponent of Jocko Willink, and I really uh, love the the fact that everything is your responsibility, which means that however some whatever somebody else says, it is up to you to determine how you receive that. So I know that I can talk with one of my buddies and call him a, a cocksucking motherfucker, and he will laugh and hit me back with something worse. But if someone were to come up that I didn't know and someone were to just throw that in my face, that wouldn't feel good, right? But I can make the diff. I can make that. I can see the difference there. And over time, I've gotten to a point where I can, you know, I can look at it and say, "There's someone that's trying to offend me. They're trying to make me angry, versus someone who is trying to make me laugh." They're saying the same thing, as you said. It's the same words, but the language is different. You got to realize something there too. Um, if they're trying to make you angry you know, anger used as an instrumental thing. Why, why do we want to make you angry? Because I want to, I want to off balance you. And, and anybody that's trying to do that is they have some kind of a point or some kind of a thing they want to make or an argument, but they're try, they're doing it from a position of weakness and they know they can't win. So they're going to beat you down to a point where they can kind of lead you down and force you to make a few mistakes and say something inappropriate. And then they can take the moral high ground that way because anybody worth their salt that wants to debate and has respect for you and, and wants to figure out your perspective on something, we'll just ask you anybody that goes the other way, they just want to be right. And, and, and they're going to play by all the dirty rules to get there. And that's what I learned from using anger. And if you, if you don't feed into that and you just kind of, you, if you respond back objectively, like that conversation gets shut down pretty, pretty quick afterwards. You know, that just, re- that reminds me a lot of uh, counterinsurgency, right? If you think about it, what the insurgents are trying to do is hit us hard enough so that we react in a very negative manner and then engage either uh, non-hostile targets or we start like in Vietnam, there was uh Oh um, man, was his name? There was the Me Lai Massacre, and it you know just yep. the the leadership wasn't there to check it, but at the same time they pushed like the the Viet Cong just pushed and pushed and pushed and pushed and pushed and stressed and stressed and stressed and stressed, and then everyone was so fucking angry that it just took one little thing and snap, done right. And what they're wanting is to beat the larger army, the 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 stronger argument by making them take a low blow and then like you said they take the moral high ground right like look at look at what they're doing they're killing people or this person just said this to me it it negates whatever argument you had because then now they have the moral high ground and uh it just as you were talking it just kind of dawned on me how similar counterinsurgency tactics are to dealing with anger or dealing with an argument or with someone who is going to use that mentality to try and bring that anger out of you because that's what they're trying to do they're trying to off balance you they're trying to hit you where you will make a mistake and then they can jump on it and move from there it's actually quite interesting now that i think about it (laughs) yeah no absolutely and even on a on a smaller scale just dealing with the people i deal with um on a daily basis um that's also you know that's also very real too you know people are always trying to goad you into you know an overuse of force or even just a response with force and and you know what happens and i mean it's all over the media all the time that 
those things happen and some people are just really good at it and also um, if you just all it takes is you could be having a day where you're not on point you could be tired you could be having other things in your mind and, and you can't focus or whatever but i think the most um the most disturbing thing you could ever present to your enemy is if they're dealing with a cold blooded objective lizard so if you don't react on any of that anger at all and and really this is where i really started to figure things out is you just have to sit back and you have to look and you have to study your enemy and whenever they try whenever someone tries to goad you with that angry response and you just kind of look at them like you're studying them and you're trying to figure something out i can tell you right now they do not like that one bit because they're like oh shit my tactic didn't work now they're figuring something out and i have no well, i don't know what they're thinking about but i don't like where this is going and like you know same thing just study your enemy and and don't let them don't let them go with you and you know look at the win in the war not so much the battle in front of your nose because you could win that battle in front of your nose and all of a sudden you know you're surrounded in the canyon and that's not it's not where you want to be at all you want to see the you want to see that canyon come and you want to flank and push them in there yeah you know it's funny because i i train jujitsu as well and it's the same concept right if i attack somebody and you know this happens i'm a white belt right so <laughs> i get i get choked out quite regularly but the um uh well not recently but normally when we're training one of the things that will happen i'll be you know working with a purple belt or a brown belt or i'll be every once in a while i'll get to roll with the black belt and as you're rolling with them they just have this look on their face like oh yeah okay yeah i know what's happening here and it it is aggravating because you know anything i do i'm just playing into them into their game right i'm just you're automatically on the defensive and you just kind of want to back off. You're like, what, 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 whoa, whoa, <laughs> like, that's not cool. And uh, I realized that I was doing it to one of the, like we had a new guy show up at the club and we were rolling. And uh, as we were rolling, I was, you know, I'm not that much more advanced, but it's uh, it's a pretty effective art. So as soon as we started rolling, he he started to looking at me like I would look at the higher belts because... I was just smiling and I was letting him do stuff because I knew he was falling into the traps that I was laying out for him. Right. Now. <laughs> it's like, Oh yeah, come on. Yeah. By all means. Yeah. You can, I will go on my back. You can get on top of me and, and we will sit in my guard and I will play this and I'll play that. And I was calm and I was thinking, and he was just getting more and more aggravated. He was getting more angry and using more strength, which was just playing more into my game. And it was, uh, it's pretty hilarious how, uh, all those things are so similar. <laughs> well, uh, I remember reading in the Book of Five Rings once, and I've said this before too, and it was the only line in there that ever stuck with me out of that whole book. I can't remember exactly quote for quote, but it was it basically went like this: if you if you can bring yourself to understand one thing, you'll be able to understand all things. And I was like, when you see the way broadly, you can see the way in all things. Is that what it is? Yeah. Okay. And I love um, that yeah. So one of my favorites. So that one eluded me actually for years until I started to really like you know. Uh, invest a lot of time into my own hobbies there like and put some real hours in and do some real exploring and the gist of it is yeah like when you can understand the fundamental of something you can kind of look at something else and take it apart and 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 see the pieces for what they are and then you can build it back up for for whatever you need to so the same idea if you're if you're you're dealing with the enemy who's insurgents who are trying to get that emotional response you know or you know you're on the mats rolling around or if you're dealing with that same guy that's just trying to you know piss you off because he just he wants a lawsuit and he just wants to you know make you look bad it's it's all the same thing you know don't don't feed into it and you're in that situation so you can either a become victim to that situation which is giving into your emotions which are predictable and whenever you're predictable people can go to wherever they want or if you can sit back and 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 try and find some clarity you can think you can problem solve and that's when you start to become truly dangerous and you become truly unpredictable and that's how you win absolutely yeah i couldn't agree more um so now here's here's the other question this took me a long time to actually figure out when do you remove yourself from a situation at what point do you, would you recognize because i mean for myself normally what'll happen uh, I start to get tremors in my left hand. I start like my hand starts to shake when I get really fucking angry. And usually as soon as that happens, I am, I'm overboard, right? I shouldn't be in that situation anymore. Uh, and that's usually my telltale, like, okay, now I need to go because I'll go from there to being totally calm and basically ready to kill anything that's in front of me. <laughs> that's not a really great scenario. There's been a couple of times where I've been in, in that 
particular scenario wasn't luckily my wife was there and she kind of pulled me away but nothing happened thankfully but what is it that you recognize like how is it when you get to a point where you're like i should not fucking be here okay so that that definitely changed um a lot over the years even just to to the point where i would remove myself from a situation so obviously before you know when you don't have things quite as much figured out like at one point it's like you know you get very irritated your voice gets elevated that you know i'm 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 like i'm pretty near ready to fucking smash something i'm not mad or whatever like that's what it used to be um obviously that's no good for nobody at all um i'd learned over the years that whenever i remove myself from a situation it's well it, it's always it's always um verbal stuff i mean at, at work i can't do that i have to remove myself from a situation i can't remove myself from a situation if it's escalating uh, as long as i'm not contributing to it so the thing is i re i have enough humility now that i know if i'm escalating something and it could even just be you know my my mere presence there and just the body language i'm conveying because i've seen that before and we just we have those people we just don't gel with you just you you take your humble pie and you leave as far as like a, an interpersonal way I find that once the once the problem starts, once the problem story stops being constructively addressed, as if we're not talking about it anymore, and we're starting to, um, we just want to defend our point. At that point, I'll find a way to shut it down. And then, if I have to do something, I'll just I'll go find something to do with I'll, I'll, to, with my hands or whatever. So it's like it looks like I'm kind of doing something constructive and and helpful, which I am. But at the same time, it's like okay, I'm kind of done. I need my distraction here or. You know, sometimes it might even be, you know, if I'm just frustrated from something at work or whatever, and it's just, I'm having a bit more of a trickier time unpacking and I come home, you know, I keep, I keep myself in check as much as I can, but then I remove myself. I'm like, okay, I need to go to the garage. I'm going to beat the tire off that bag. And then I'm probably going to feel a lot better about myself. I'm going to think about it. But yeah, to sum it up, whenever the, the, the issue at hand stops being construct, uh, constructively addressed. That's a, that's and that's, look at I found that to be very, very fucking tricky. Like you got to, you got to still have a degree of control over yourself. Like, even though, like I said, yeah, you're getting the feelings. It's okay to have those feelings. It's just the feelings don't have to be acted on. So then, you know, like we were saying earlier, okay, something changed here. Why am I feeling this? Okay. I'm not getting what I want. The problem's not being solved. Now it's, I'm having to defend my character versus, you know, talk with the point. So it's like, okay, it's done right now. Let's go take a cool off or whatever. And then we'll come back and address it again. But right now this can't happen. Yeah. And I'm, I'm very much a, a person like that where like, I can't keep sitting there and talking about it. Like I just, I have to, yeah, stop talking about it completely and go somewhere else. Cause it's like, okay, I just need to, I need to calm down here. I know what I need to do, but I need to calm down. Yeah. I, I get in these things. Um, it doesn't happen very much anymore. I think a lot of my, when I started studying leadership and I started realizing how much, um, how much I not only, uh, affect the people around me, but just the way I'm standing, like my body language, what, how I'm feeling in general, without any words, how I'm actually affecting everyone around me. Uh, but I used to get into these things a lot more. I used to call them, or I call them rage spirals, uh, where something stupid will happen, something little, right? And you'll get angry at it. And I'll be like, why the fuck? This is bullshit and stupid. And then you'll realize that you're getting way more angry than you should be about something small. And then you start getting angry about the fact that you're angry about it and that you shouldn't be angry. And then you realize that you can't not be angry right now. And that makes you even more angry. And then it just becomes this cycle of rage. Just to leave me... Like I, I, there were periods where I just would black out. I'd have no idea what the fuck happened. Like the stress would just get to a point where I would have these uh, blank spots. And I remember at one point I woke up, uh, not woke up, but I like kind of came to realize realization or, uh, and I had all my gear on I had my tack vest and my rifles out. <laughs> like I was loaded for bear, ready to go. And I, I just was sitting in my basement with all my stuff on it. I don't know why I was there. And what I found out was for myself in order to get out of that, I had to interdict it somewhere. And usually it was the moment I realized I was angry at something. So I would remove myself from whatever it was I was being angry at, or <clears throat> I would play video games that were, um, that required my brain to think about something else strategy wise, or something that involved a higher level of thinking. And, uh, one of the other ones that I actually found worked really well was, uh, weapons drills because it actually removed thought completely and made, required me to be present. Uh, and then, you know, over time, I got to a point where martial arts has helped a lot again, where I was doing jujitsu, I was at the gym and um, was able to have that physical outlet. Uh, the mental side of it was still extreme. Do you have anything like that or any tips for people that would be going through something like that? Um, 
Yeah, I mean, the, I I use the same kind of uh, things you do. They're they're healthy coping mechanisms. Now, understand. I want people listening though too to understand that they are just a um, they're a way to put you in a better headspace. They don't fix your problem. They just they put you in a better headspace to deal with it. And like you were saying, you know, it it kind of you kind of switch gears because if you just focus on that, you focus more and you dwell about it, you think about it, and then and you don't know after a while. You're like, how the fuck did I get here? Yeah, you know, you kind of hit that in the head. So. Um, yeah, I just, uh, physical, physical fitness, anything is very important. I really like the combative arts as well, uh, because not only do you get to drain all the chemical horse shit out of your system, but you also, um, you get to vent off your aggression as well. The other thing I did add on to that, and, uh, it's actually something I'm just getting ready, uh, either later on today or, or tomorrow to throw up my thing. I know people do like meditative things or relaxation breathing or whatever but try it next time after an extremely hard workout do it immediately then so what i do is when i'm out here whenever i'm completely finished my exercise i just i set an alarm on my phone i set it for eight minutes it, the time doesn't matter but if you can do it for longer it seems to obviously have a better effect i do it because i don't want to sit there and get lost in the time i know when that alarm goes off i've put my eight minutes in and all i do is i just sit there quietly and breathe and there's different ways of doing it you know i think one method is four in hold four four out i do six in hold for one six out that works for me or whatever and whatever works for you it doesn't matter but i find it just when you do that it brings you to so much more of a lower level and just it, it i don't know i i cannot describe that feeling you just, you have to try it, and it it's simply amazing so getting back on point then it also now it's like okay now i'm in a better headspace to deal with whatever the hell I had going on for sure. Because now I'm like super calm down. Not only I wore out and, and I got all my, you know, my hitting into my system, but it's like, okay, now I'm just kind of, everything's calmed down as well. Yeah. Yeah. It's, you know, um, tactical breathing, the, the, the box breathing it's called also, or circle breathing, you know, four in, four out, uh, or four in, hold four out four, hold four, the, the box breathing. Uh, we used to use yep. it for gunfighter and stuff like that, just to keep your, you know, scan and breathe, scan and breathe. I don't know how many times I've heard that over the years. <laughs> no doubt. But just, uh, sorry, just, just because we're still, just while we're still on that topic there to, to, um, to address the other question though, too. And I kind of touched on it above, uh, being angry at something and then angry, but angry and then, you know, angry that you can't be angry. Again, it's, it starts off as something you can't control and then you don't resolve it. And then, you know, you get a few more things that build up. And so every time you don't resolve something, you're putting those emotional trip lines out. So, you know, once you get so many out there, it's like anything that comes in with a near you, it sets you off more or less. Right. So, yep. and then that's why you're angry, but at being angry, I, would you say it's angry or are you more embarrassed that you're angry? Cause I know I sit there and I'm like, I'm like, this is so fucking stupid. Why am I, why am I angry? But it's like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm riled up. But at the same time, I'm like, it's kind of a fucking embarrassing. Like I should be above this. Like what the fuck is wrong with me? Yeah. It's because it's just a, I think it's just an oversaturation of unresolved issues and you got all that shit floating around in your blood. And that's it. it I really do believe it's as simple as that. And it just takes, it takes like anything that's worthwhile. If you want to set that right, then that's where the, the physical fitness and, and just, you know, being mindful comes into play. I, I really have found those two things to, to make life a lot easier. Yeah, I, I agree with you totally. You know, one of the things that we did with my, my therapist and I, we started doing equine therapy uh, early on and we saw, you know, huge leaps in my own treatment and getting better. And I saw a huge, um, drop in the occurrences of these the rage spirals that i would get into uh just due to the fact that i was able to deal with it through the dock through the horses through um being in the moment and not being able to unpack the issue right and that was that was the key was that i need to unpack the issue uh and anchor is one of those things as you said it, it puts out those little tripwires i like how you put that because it's so true once you start being even a little bit angry anything can make you more angry. It doesn't take much to make you more angry. And then you get more angry if somebody fucking brings it up. And then, you know, the, the humility it takes to recognize that you're angry. And then the humility on top of that to go, I shouldn't be here right now, or I'm not being helpful right now, or I'm not being constructive right now, or this is not going to help me in the long run. Those are all huge leaps that you have to make mentally because it's so hard to even grasp those thoughts right it's uh it's definitely worth it's definitely worth the time though because anger 
Anger's anger's kind of like a drug though too. It can be very intoxicating because you you know you do you get that that drip of that cocktail. Like I said, it supercharges you. You know, it does make you feel you know more powerful physically that way. Um, the unfortunate thing as well though too is you know it, it kind of unsettles people. So you know you it sometimes uh, even unconsciously if we don't realize it because we're all susceptible to it. You know it, it it feels like you just have more power over a crowd because you know nobody wants to say anything or contest you. So it it truly is horrible and ugly if you if you frame it that way as well. So I think if you look at it under under that lens, it really fucking drives home the point that we need to understand this understand what do i need to do and what do i need to do to lessen this because those are those are the characteristics that you actually are conveying and they truly are very ugly characteristics absolutely you know i was watching a uh, a jordan peterson lecture uh on youtube at one point in time and it was he was discussing anger and he was saying how incredibly toxic anger is for the human body uh in terms of long-term access to it in that it is by the, the spikes in adrenaline and dopamine and all these chemicals that are running through your body because you're angry, it affects your heart, it affects your your circulatory system, it affects your your digestive system, people get ulcers, you know, there's all, all sorts of medical issues, long-term chronic medical issues that stem from an overabundance of anger, which is actually, I find fascinating that an emotion can physically alter you to such a degree. Well, think of it, uh, think of it this way. You, uh, you have your car out there, um, your car is made to run at, you know, say 190 horsepower, you bolt on a supercharger that gives it 200 more horsepower. That son of a bitch is going to burn out real quick. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's definitely, you know, it's a, it's going to burn out, uh, quicker than it was intended to do. So what happens again, and, and it very is, it starts emotionally, but it is a physical thing because when you're putting those chemicals in your body, you don't, those chemicals are made for your body to run on a higher performance, which is not designed to run on all the time. And so where the breakdown becomes then is if your body's running super hard that way to give yourself the performance, guess what's taking a hit your immune system. And now you're more prone to every other thing, colds and sickness and all this other shit and, and, and things start, uh, they just don't work right or things are working too fast. So that's where you start developing, like you are saying, some of those more serious things. Um, so yeah no like it's it is emotional but that's I, i'm pretty sure that's how it works uh physically as well so again there's another incentive to get a handle on it absolutely you know have you ever heard of a term called endurance hunting endurance hunting no i haven't okay so this is apparently a, a technique that we used uh, as humans very early on just to based off the fact that we have a larger endurance capacity than most mammals and uh what they would do would basically you'd you'd chase after a deer or a pig or whatever right but you would just kind of jog after it continually, right? And it would bolt off for a second and then stop, and then you would still be after it. So it would bolt off again, and then it would it would never get a chance to actually bring its heart rate down and its breathing rate down, uh, and you would just continue to chase after it and chase after it and chase after it and chase after it. And then eventually its system would just overload. Its heart would like explode, and its lungs would not be able to work anymore, and it would just fall over dead because it overheated itself. Uh, it... Uh, it was running too hot for too long and it just couldn't handle it. And then you could just walk over, bang, done. There's your meal, right? And all you had to do was jog with three or four guys so you would direct it in a certain way and just keep at it, keep at it, keep at it. So, you know, it, it, it'll freaking kill you <laughs> if you're running that hot for that long. And it, it's quite an interesting emotion to really get involved. And in. that's why I wanted to have this conversation, especially was the fact that so many people, especially veterans, you know, we get out of the military and we're just angry at fucking everything. Or, you know, even in the army, we're angry at everything. We get bitter about this and that, the other thing, and I didn't get this course or whatever. And we utilize that anger physically to do the job, but it just eats away at us from the inside. And I really wanted to have a discussion on it because it's something that we don't talk about normally. Yeah, no, that, uh, that's a very interesting concept with the endurance hunting. That's, uh, and I remember reading something a long time ago when we were in school about the, the horses um, as well. They were saying... Um, you know, a horse will beat a human every time in a, in a two mile run, but like a 26 mile run, like a marathon is like the horse will come a sad second every time. So that's kind of, that's kind of actually interesting that somebody actually took that and actually, um, they tried it out, but, um, yeah, you, you, you feel yourself with anger. You're running on board time. Uh, the other thing too, talking to, uh, to Corey there on my, on my other podcast, I just put it out, uh, yesterday and, um, you know, just because you don't get something the first time around or something doesn't work out for you 
if you get angry, you miss other opportunities as well. It's like, okay, you, you focus on this one thing, this one thing you wanted, but then you might miss something that you might be able to try and you might actually enjoy it as well, or you might enjoy it more and you, you just don't know, but you, you, you completely, you completely deprive yourself of that uh, opportunity right off the get go, just from that. Or, you know, the other thing that's interesting about taking some courses is sometimes you meet people that are very interesting on there and, you know, the, the friendships and the bonds you form and, and, you know, later on, whatever you end up in life, the networks you can, you know, you have the potential of getting into, you, you, you give all that up for what, because you're chasing the carrot this way. What about this bag of carrots that could potentially be over here? Right. Yeah. It's such a, um, such an eye opening thing for me when I, I stopped, I stopped working myself up about what other people did. And that was one of the things that I learned from uh, reading Jocko's book, Extreme Ownership, was that if you allow other people's actions to control your emotions, they're controlling you. They're actually controlling you. And if you don't allow your emotions to be controlled by other people's actions, then you're controlling yourself. And man, it just has made a huge difference in my own life. I've gotten to a point where... You know, I used to get upset when something didn't go my way or I'd have a plan and it didn't quite come together the way I wanted it to and I'd get so pissed off about it. Now, I just look at it as uh, an, another opportunity, right? If, I, if I, I got injured while I was training, okay, good. I needed to, I needed a break, right? If I, if I got tapped out, good. That means I'm not as good as I thought I was, right? It just, it uh, instills that humility. And I, I know I'm quoting Jocko here from one of his... Uh, one of his podcasts there many i can't remember which one it was on but it it is such a great aspect to look at challenges and to look at things that don't go your way as a good thing because are you going to get angry about a good thing nope it's a good thing and if you look at um uh everything as an opportunity either an opportunity to learn or an opportunity to get better or an opportunity to learn to uh, do something different then what's there to get angry about yeah and uh, the other thing too is um you know, say for example, if 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 you fail at something, and and you get angry at it, what does that uh, what does that show you for uh, who your character is? The first thing you have to ask yourself is is why did I fail? I mean, I've I've failed at lots of stuff that I tried out for in life. I've also uh, come top candidate or, or or you know best of on on some other things. And the only thing, the only difference between those things were my levels of motivation and my investment in those things in particular, like some of those things that I did really well in, I did really well because I just, I found them interesting and I put all kinds of extra time in them because I'm like, Hey, this is kind of neat. I like this. I want to play with it. I want to explore it. And I did really well in those things. Um, the ones that I, I, I failed at was like, okay, I'd kind of like to try this and I think I'm doing okay or whatever, but it's like, okay, well, if I, you know, I put some effort in, but not the whole effort and somebody else passes. I have, I really have nobody else to blame with me because it's like we, you know, for the most part, you're going to have access to the same kind of information. And the only thing that changes is, is your hunger for the outside peripheral information that'll give you the leg up on the competition. And that's what I've found anyways, in the past from things that I've done good at and things that I've royally fucked up. And, you know, that makes a big difference. So, you know, if, yeah, if you're fine and you're getting angry at it, be like, well, how bad do I want this? Do I want to get better and take another crack at it or is it this show me how much i really don't want it right yeah absolutely and you know the as, you know, i don't know how many times we've said it now but the humility to recognize that because that is one of the hardest things i've found in my life is to be is to actually recognize that i don't know everything even though i feel like i i know it logically that i don't know everything but when you're working on something or you're trying to get a task done or you're you know building an event or whatever it is and it's not going your way, it is mind numbing sometimes into the point that you're just like, how, how is this not working? It should be working the way I planned it. It should be working. The thing that we don't realize is that we usually are planning in a vacuum, right? So we're not talking to other people. We're not getting other people's input. We're just developing this concept of what should happen based off of what we already know about a topic that we don't know anything about. So <laughs> it's kind of, counterintuitive but that's how our brain works right and to to have the the humility uh to recognize that you don't know everything about that subject or that you need to learn more or either uh even as you said you know is this something that i really want to spend my time on that is it's a huge leap for a lot of people to get uh past the fact that they just need to get it done 
Yeah, especially if you're uh, especially if you're working in a team, there's you, ha- you really have two options. You have or you can be like, listen, I know this is important. I- I'm really struggling with this. Do you have any insights with me to help? If if it's if you feel it's that important that you need to get, you specifically need to contribute that to the team, then you ask those hard questions. And yeah, you got to sit back and check your ego, and and that's okay because people just people know more about different things because you know there might be something that they're more interested in you in you are and you know conversely if it's not that important to the team and you're like well i tried it but you know this and that but i'm i'm really good at this so this is what i'm good at this is what kind of, what i'm going to stick with this is how i'm going to contribute to the team this is how i most effectively can make everyone else better it's not that important try it see what happens if it if you fail okay cool you learn something from it right but again you got to check check that ego right like that's not the key yeah just the other thing i was going to say is if you're working in a team environment uh it never hurts to ask somebody else who might know more for some insight. It makes you look like you're willing also to, to accept information, which is huge because you have to work together if you're on a team. And if that's not working for you or you don't feel like you need to do it and someone else can do it better, if you can offer something else better and that can bring everybody else up and make everybody stronger, then just stick with that thing. There's there's nothing wrong with that. You're just your 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 focus is you're that guy. Hey, if you want to go see the the weapons guy or if you want to go see the demolitions guy, you know, it's like go see Chance or go see Grant. Those guys, they got, you know, whatever. So there's nothing wrong with that either. No, I, I actually just had a conversation with someone earlier today um, that, you know, everyone has a job, right? And there is no shame in that even throughout the military our whole system is built on the fact that everybody has a job right the infantry have a job the engineers have a job the armored have a job the artillery the clerks the msc ops the uh, mat techs the signalers the medics we all have different jobs specifically for that reason so that if you need somebody they're right there right the infantry don't go oh man i came onto this minefield i better figure out how to how to get through it when you have a bunch of engineers standing beside you, when we're like, dude, that's like our entire job. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You got, we got our first aid type equipment or you guys got like the real McCoy that gets it done right and right now and a lot safer. Yeah, exactly. And it, but it's, it's an ego check at the same time. You have to be able to say, okay, yeah, sure. Like I can, I'm a, I was a C9 gunner, right? I can shoot a nine. I can jump on the firefight and I can get engaged and good times. Woohoo. We can shoot at people. Yay. But if there's an IED and I'm busy shooting at stuff, who's doing my job, right? Yeah, exactly. It doesn't make any sense. I had a conversation with another infantry guy about um, uh, room clearances, and I was like, you know, I really want to get in a fight. And he's like, yeah, but your job is to blow fucking doors down. It's my job to go storming into the room. And I was like, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. And I'm like, but I could shoot someone with my shotgun. And I'm like, he's like, yeah, you could, but I can also get in the room with two or three guys before you can actually get your shotgun back up from your charge getting off. And I was like, yeah, yeah, that makes sense too. It's all in that everyone has that job, right? And he, I had to check my ego to say, oh, well, I guess I can't kick a door down and pull a shotgun up and shoot a dude all at the same time. <laughs> yeah, I know. But anything with breaching, though, that's that that's a super important job. I'd be like, okay, if you're the designated door guy, perfect. Because if you put lots and lots of practice on that, get that fucking door down and we'll get in there. But I, yeah, like we don't want to fuck that part up. So like if you're putting the time in there, <clears throat> you do that and we'll, yeah, we'll get into the other the other thing or whatever. But yeah. Just, yeah, when just, and just knowing it's knowing that someone else puts so much more effort into something that you can kind of put that faith in them as well. is like, that's kind of reassuring as well. Cause it's like, okay, I don't have to worry about this. I just have to worry about this part of it. Yep. And that's, I think that's what you get when you put your ego aside and when you move that into your daily life, right? If, if you're working on a team in an office environment and you're trying to get this report done, but you don't really know all that much about it. Cause you, you know, haven't put much time into it and you're like, oh, well, Jacob's down the street or down the cubicle row. He he's done a lot of these. Maybe I should go ask him for help instead of just sitting there getting aggravated about doing it. Just fucking go down and talk to him, right? Yeah, and I just want to touch on something else since we're talking about anger and and teams and more specifically inter interdepartmental teams and like um, as it relates to things even outside the military. Like obviously there we're we're depending on each other for survival, but you know you see a lot of other interdepartmental teams where you know it's like well my job is the most important well, no, fuck you, my job's more important. So like my shit takes precedence. Um, again, the, and you can get into a, a very unproductive fight there pretty quick and a lot of stupid emails back and forth and, and bickering and, and other people involved. And and again, that's just an ego check. Be like, okay, this is what we need to do. This is the goal. How do we get to the goal? How do I, how do, how do I incorporate you into my end and what can I do for you and how can we work together? 
um, this this is what I need to do. And like, you know, from a, a, a policy type of thing, like this is what I have to adhere to. How about you? Can you work around that or vice versa? And sometimes, holy fuck, when you approach it like that, it's like, that's a game changer. Yeah. Like you get stuff done so easily. But again, it's very easy to get caught in the middle of that tribal warfare because my tribe is better than your tribe. But it's like, no, the fucking tribes have to work together to take down the, you know, the Goliath, the proverbial Goliath. Absolutely. It's a long game, right? You gotta, you gotta play the long game and, or the, you know, as you said earlier, the war, not the battle, right? It's, you can, if your ego can take a shot or two in order to, you know, lose this battle, but win the war game on, right? Look, yeah, done. <laughs> and that's like, you know, those little things that you, you know, you chalk up to minor bullshit or whatever. It's like you add up like, you know, 15 or 20 of those things, all of a sudden they become a big thing. You get a, you know, 15 or 20 of those little, again, those little chemical trickles in there, it adds up to basically the equivalent of one big one. And if you don't resolve that, then, you know, that comes back again to those emotional trip wires again. You got, now you got a shit pile of them out again and you don't know why you're getting angry with the stupidest things. Cause it's like, I deal with stupid people all the time. Well, are they really stupid people or are we just not understanding the scope of the situation here? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's it. I've, I've started looking at it, uh, especially in interpersonal relationships. I look at it more from a, what am I doing wrong? Like if we're not understanding each other, I'm not communicating properly. I don't look at it as this guy is stupid or this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. It's I'm not engaging this person properly, or I'm not just, I'm not uh, describing my point eloquently enough or i'm you know it i'm just looking at it as i'm the problem because i'm the only one that i can control right at the end of the day it's all about me you can only control yourself i can only control myself so how i react in that interpersonal relationship shouldn't be me trying to change you it should be me trying to change me so that you and i can communicate yeah no 100 percent. it goes back to what we talked about earlier again by leading by example um, if I tell you, Chance, you're fucking wrong, and this is why you're fucking wrong, what's that going to make you want to do? do? You're going to dig your heels in. You're going to defend your argument even more now because I'm attacking your ego. So, right. yes, by by asking yourself, okay, what am I doing wrong? Again, this comes back to leading by example. The person's going to see you take a step back. They're going to see you readjust and, and you know, take the different approach, and they're going to mirror that. Because if you don't, if you go the other way, well, guess what? You're going to get exactly the fight you're looking for. Yeah, it's funny. Uh, again, listening to Jocko a lot, he says, you know, you can you can charge up a hill and take on, uh, you know, a bunkered position with a machine gun. You can take them on head on, but you're probably going to die. <laughs> it's just, it seems so useless to, to even try that concept. But that's what we do a lot of the times in, when we're dealing with conflict in between people is that we just, this is my fucking... This is the way I think. Deal with it. And the other person is like, well, this is the way I fucking think. You deal with it. And no one's willing to go, well, what if I just take a step off to the left here and then I can, you know, engage him from the flank? It seems logical, but it's a lot more challenging than we let on. Yeah, there's a guy I was having a chat with yesterday. He uh, he was saying that too. He's like, uh, this one of his instructors told him, he's like, you know, when you're dealing with people, you have to look at it this way. People people are not out to get you. They're just out for their own best interest. So if you can understand that, then that kind of goes into, you know, understanding that don't attack somebody's ego. Don't attack them. Like you just said directly on because yeah, you're going to take a lot of casualties and a lot of damage getting your point across and it might not even get across. Yeah. So yeah, it's no point. Okay. I just wanted to, we're going to finish off here real quick. And I, I wanted to go over a protocol that uh, my, my doc and I worked with quite a bit. So give me your little, points on this as we're going i'm going to hit each little one here and then you can give me a uh, a lowdown on your feelings on the overall on how how you would react to a situation so i got into that this was a few years ago this is when i was still actually more than a few years ago this is when i was still really agitated about a lot of things and my ptsd was really uh it was in my head a lot so we were out back behind my house we're in this little park i had my dog with me he was off leash who is normally very well uh behaved and I trained him to a pretty high degree and he, as I wasn't paying attention, he had gotten up and kind of sauntered over to this other table. He wasn't close to them, but he's a slightly bigger dog. He was a, a shepherd, great Pyrenees cross. So he's a, he's a bigger dog. And this guy jumps up and starts yelling at me and I call my dog over and he comes immediately and he sits down beside me and it's no big deal. And I'm like, Hey man, you know what? I'm sorry. He, I should have him on a leash. It's my bad. Uh, no big deal. And he started laying into me and he was just like, well, what if my son was allergic and then my guy, my kid would be dead now. And this is all your fault. And he was like looking for a fight. 
And at the time, so was I. So <laughs> I, uh, I, wa- I stepped into him and I got really dead quiet and I was dead calm and I was like, you better step away before I rip your fucking throat out. And luckily enough, my wife had grabbed my shoulder and was like physically dragging me away <laughs> as this was all happening. Luckily, nothing came of it because I, I would have killed the guy. But I realize now after dealing with my doctors for a while that what I what I do now and what I should have done then was first off, just leave, right? Like he can yell at me all he wants. I can just leave, whatever, right? He might think he won, but in the long run, I've already left the situation. If uh, once you're out and you're still angry and you're really uh, jacked up, the first thing that I always do is I find my body. So as you said, breathing, that's a big one. Uh, I do tactical breathing. So in four, hold four, out four, hold four. And I just breathe, breathe, breathe. And I start doing specific muscle relaxation. So I actually find where, you know, if my shoulders are up, bring them down, actively bring them down. If my fists are clenched, actively open them. If my jaws clenched, actively open it up and physically or cognitively relax those muscle groups. The next step is a cognitive de-escalation. So you actually have to get inside your own head and say, is what he is saying true? Is he, is my, is my mother really a bitch? Is my dog uh, a mutt? Is my wife a whore? Or like, are all these things actually true? If they are, so what? If they're not, so what? Like I, to actively go through them in your head, check them off and unpack the anger that stems from them. Uh, and then afterwards, once your, your body and your mind is starting to calm, do an AAR you know, how do I feel about what just happened? How do I, um, how do I move forward from this? What do I learn from this? How is this uh, going to benefit me in the long run? And then also at the end of the day, you got to be gracious with yourself and say, you know, I'm still me, regardless of what happened, I'm still me. And that's the the general protocol I have now that's in place for uh, really bad anger issues. Wish I'd had them years ago, but uh, you know, I have what I have right now. Do you have any thoughts on any of that? Uh, I really like that uh, structured system. Um, it's a pretty good, um, it's a pretty good A to Z approach. You know, kind of first you remove yourself, and then yeah, you know, you kind of start with uh, the physical aspect, and then you move into the mental. And I think the, I think the uh, process of doing that is good because it, all those stress things they do start physical, and then they manifest mentally. So I really like that idea. And if I, the next time I do find myself um, in that kind of situation, I. I have this sitting out actually in front of me here, so it's good. I can use it as a reference point. Um, how you reacted to this situation still turned out actually really good. Uh, this is because I teach, um, I do teach self-defense too as well uh, on a different project of mine. And I can tell you right now, this is another one of those things where if you let anger get in your way and you, we never really know how much it could cost you. So what you have here is... It, did, did the guy actually have a kid out there with him? Yeah, he had his wife and his son out there with him. Okay, so so the problem is the problem is you, you have the commitment from the other party. So obviously the guy is there. He's you know his wife could have been pushing him too, saying all those things. Plus now he's going to get all riled up about saying you know the allergic or what if the dog attacks. So he he has a very committed um, involvement in this because you know, as you know, anybody that has kids is like, you're going to stand up for your kids. You'd give your life for your kids. That guy is willing to go to distance. And if you engage him, you, you're, you're going to have a big fight on your hands. Not only that, um, you know, if, if your dog was off the leash, they, they could come after you legally. Yep. If, if anything, if anything were to happen, they could come after you legally that way. Now, the other thing is if you actually get into a physical altercation, um, somebody that's jacked up, it's going to take a lot of, it's going to take a lot of effort just to subdue them because they're going to be supercharged with adrenaline. And what happens there is your risk for injury goes way up, broken teeth, broken bones, you know, all kinds of internal bleeding, who knows? Um, those things, they, they, those are life-changing events. Not only that, again, that's another legal thing. So now it's like every couple of weeks you're getting emails from lawyers and, and it's costing you like thousands and thousands of dollars just to say some, for somebody to say, okay, you were wrong, but you're not really that wrong. So do it again. Like it very realistically has the potential to do that. So whenever we come back to finishing off with the um, reflection phase of it, you know, it's very important to take things into consideration, um, take those kinds of things into consideration. And again, that's why I think anger is not really useful at all. It's a very ugly thing because it can cost you all sorts of things like that. Um, the only other thing I maybe, 
and this is just me sitting here armchair quartering back and get like like I said, you were in your situation. If you had all those things going on at that point, I think you did pretty stellar if you could keep it uh, under wraps like that. I think the only thing that could change it is arming yourself with more knowledge. So for example, and the only thing is you have to put yourself into the breach though too. You kind of have to deal with people like that. And sometimes that I've learned, even me, I've learned that if I'm in the wrong, you change your body language to something that's a little bit more submissive. You fucking, you bite the bullet because you know that just what I just mentioned, all those things could have or could potentially happen. So it's like, I don't want to deal with none of that at all. And I, and I know those things happen to people. So there's a bit of, um, there's a bit more power knowledge. So, I find it's easier not to beat yourself up, I guess, if you have to tactically withdraw like that. So change your body language and more submissive and be very apologetic and just fucking leave. And that's it. And if you ever see that guy again, if you have your dog out there, just, you know what, go to a different park or go somewhere else or don't even just be near them. But yeah, I mean, those things are very unfortunate. There's a lot of factors that come into play. Like I said, the amount of trip lines you have out at the time, yeah. plus if you have other people there as well, like some people too, it, we're kind of, we're kind of stupidly wired that way too. Like if we have our wives or if we have our girlfriends or whoever's there and you know, we kind of have to look like we're brave because we never want to look like the coward, but you know, you, you start talking to, you know, you start asking your wife stuff like that too. be like, well, did I make the right uh, move to get out of here? They want us to be smart. They don't want us to be brave. They actually think we're very stupid when we do that. If we can, if we can find an out, uh, as I found out. And so, like I said, knowing all those things gives you a lot more power to maneuver. Um, you know, if you just have, so to put it into military terms, if all you have is your your C8 and you're going into this conflict, your, your options are very limited. But if you have a C8 and say like, uh, you know, you have your C9 gunner on the flank and you have a couple of grenades and you have like your, your mortar support and all those things um, to take somebody on you have a lot more options now to handle a situation, right? So, so arm yourself with more tools. The more tools you have, the more knowledge you have, the better you can maneuver those situations. And again, you're still going to feel those feelings. They're still going to be there, but it's a lot easier to override them when you understand how things could play out and, and why people are acting a certain way. Cause you know what, that guy, he, he, he probably was, would be in the right. Like he's a concerned father. Okay, sure. And um, you know what? Put you know, put yourself put yourself in the reverse role too, right? Um, if you had somebody like that and a big scary dog, and if you didn't know if it was if it was angry or not, and like you know, if you weren't like a, a a dog person yourself or an animal person, you know, these are just city folks that probably you know never grew up outside of a out of a city, so they don't know anything like that. And 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 from their perspective, that's that's horribly scary, right? So I mean, put yourself in there, and and then you realize, okay. I'm just going to walk away from this. Yep. Um, yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. Three bags, you know, yes or no, sir. Three bags full. I'm out of here kind of deal. And it makes it a lot easier to just to, to get out of there. I couldn't agree with you more. I, you know, I look back on the situation and I learned quite a bit from it in just in terms of how I was reacting to the situation. And I, it was also like, like I said, I was still in, I was not at a point where I had really dealt with any of the issues from my post-traumatic stress, I just had a diagnosis and I was still really angry about fucking everything. So I was going from a sense of his, I recognized the escalation and then I went from being normal and like, Hey man, sorry about my dog to, I need to kill this person. <laughs> I just, I went straight into combat mode. Uh, luckily for my, I'm, I'm very thankful for my wife. She was there to actually, she recognized the change immediately and grabbed onto my shoulder and was physically pulling me back away out of the situation. And yeah, I can't thank her enough because like you said, there are so many other things that happen on top of just a physical altercation. We think of it in terms of, you know, how we used to deal with it in high school or junior high, you know, you get into a fight and oh, okay, whatever, right? You have a black guy for a little while. As adults, you can do some serious damage to each other. You can do serious damage to yourself. And then on top, that's just the physical side of it. Then there's the uh, the financial side to it. There's the the legal side to it. There's the there's so many things that are involved in an altercation between adults that is so much more than just a fit fight. Yeah. So this is a this is a great way to promote kind of what we're doing as well. The both of us on the side. So you know, leave your leave your fighting into the cages, into the rings where you can put mouth guards and gloves in and pound your frustrations out that way because everybody kind of agrees to that and they accept that. Anywhere else, not a chance. Yeah. Absolutely. It's uh, totally right now. So we've been going a little bit over an hour and change now. Uh, we're just going to wrap it up. And do you have any final points, anything you want to uh, say before we go? Um, just to kind of reiterate what we, what we spoke on here, you know, if you, 
again, what I said at the beginning, if you ever find you're banging your head against the wall, it's because it's something you can't control. So take a step back and, and, and take a look at it and just ask yourself the question, you know, what, what can I do different here? And, and is it, first of all, the thing is look at yourself. Hey, is this something that I'm causing? That's the one biggest thing that I found is really helpful. Am I causing this fucking problem here? Cause half the time it is. So you got to be honest with yourself first. And then, uh, if not, then change your communication up a little bit, you know, according and if you have to do whatever you need to do to kind of knock yourself down a couple of levels, if you have the luxury to do that, uh, then do it. Other than that, I mean, you know, just kind of what I was talking about earlier too, with the project I got going on there, you know, be the example. Do you want to be the hothead running around and just yelling and, and getting everybody, uh, getting everybody all wound up and, and nothing productive get done. And if you don't, then guess what? You've, you've got some homework to do and that's not horrible. You're going to learn, you're going to learn a lot of things about yourself. You're going to learn, learn a lot of things about people in general, and you're going to have a lot less stress, but you know, take the time to study this stuff. If it takes you, you know, I put it into this context, if it takes you even 10 hours, if you read two or three books in 10 hours or, or watch some seminars, 10 hours is going to set you up for the rest of your life. Yeah. Like what is that? what does that cost in the end when you look at it that way with way much less stress and people are going to like you and respect you and want to listen to you more. What's, what's that going to cost? Right. So, I mean, if anything, that's, that's just it there. Those small time investments mean like a lifetime. I, I couldn't agree more. And I just want to, to, you know, thank you so much for coming on here because I think we got some really, really great tools for people to, to look at and some really great information just on anger and, management and conflict i mean we covered a wide gambit of stuff today and it's it's been awesome so thank you so much for being on here it's been it's been really great i i really appreciate uh your time and you having me on here and i was kind of i was kind of thinking about before the uh before the show started here i'm like okay what am i what am i really going to be able to offer here but yeah i guess uh working in one of the more toxic environments in the uh in the world you kind of you pick up a few things that kind of help along the way so i'm kind of glad that you know, if, if somebody finds something to use here, I mean, that's great. Well, that's, that's the whole point of tools for the toolbox, right? Is it's just more tools. You never know when you might be able to pull this out. And it just might be that one thing that helps. Might One thing that saves you might be that one thing that uh, makes you a better person. As you said, what is, uh, what is an hour's worth of time listening to a podcast compared to your whole life if it helps? And not only that, I just want to drop this because of where I work too. And I've heard this, I've heard this, I think once every year for everywhere, everywhere I work there, you are one bad decision from ending up in a place like that where I work. So, you know, whenever you're getting mad about something, fuck, is it really worth getting mad about? That is a very, very solid point because you're absolutely right. One bad decision away from ending up in a very, very bad place. That concludes this episode of The Toolbox. I want to thank you for listening. I hope you were able to use some of the information that was offered. I want to thank all those putting it on the line for us every day. Military, veterans, first responders, and public servants. Keep up the good work. I look forward to bringing you more tools for your toolbox. And until next time, stay open, stay humble, and stay focused. Chimo.